find your way back to your seat now. I love you, Davis. <laughs> I don't know whose birthday it is, but you are big blessed. Danny, Julie, Julie, happy birthday, Julie, you're amazing. <laughs> Guys, she sings like a beast in the best, best way. She points people to Jesus, it's beautiful. Alrighty, well, I have a quick announcement for you. We have amazing things ahead for today. So, guys, do you know what's happening this Friday night? Do you know what's happening this Friday night? Hey, men, I need to hear you too. Do you know what's happening this Friday night? The table event, yes. So, men, you are gonna be in the CC lobby in the rec room having tacos. So if you wanna be there, Scan this QR code and RSVP so we know we have enough food for you. And then ladies will be in Jack Moore Hall having totes and root beer floats. And so you guys scan this QR code and RSVP. It's going to be an absolutely incredible time of fellowship. Yeah, that's what I'm talking about. And have you guys gone to your block table groups yet? Yes. Listen, you do not want to miss what God has in these small group settings, okay? You're going to get to make new friendships, new relationships. You're going to see Jesus in a whole new way. And so, men, this is the day, floors, times, and all of your information for the table groups throughout the week. And then the next one is the ladies. This is yours. And these are on rotation, so if you guys don't catch it right now, you'll see them tomorrow morning. But we want to see you at the table event this Friday night. So love you guys. And without further ado, I'd like to welcome up Elijah Bowen, our Dean of Men. Let's hear it. Hey, can we give it up for Christiana, Dean Chris? She has done, and Hannah, Dean Hannah over there. Let me tell you what. We got this table event this Friday for the guys and the girls, but more than anyone else, the people who have put work into this is the women's department. They've really, it's their brainchild. They started last semester. The guys are joining this semester, but can we just honor them for all the work that they've put into the table events and the small groups? We love you guys. Incredible. Hey, you guys remember when we did our prayer for the nations and we had um, Joshua Aaron and Aaron Schultz join us for that and they were able to um, lead worship and we did prayer over the nations. They ended with prayer over Israel. Um, they mentioned a conference that's gonna be happening. Do we have that slide, media team? So the conference is September 14th through 16th. It's a worship conference, but hey, listen, this is a really, really awesome opportunity that they wanted to bless CFNI students. So I know that they shared a QR code and the original price for the conference is like 200 something dollars. However, they wanted to give a 90% discount to CFNI students. So if you guys want to go to the conference, this, it, they are offering $25 for all three days that you wanna go, which is an incredible deal. Literally, like we're so blessed on how much they are offering for us as CFNI. We're gonna be helping out with several different things at the conference. There will be a CFNI presence, but they wanted CFNI students to be there. So just as a reminder, this is only for CFNI students, so can't share this QR code with just friends and family and getting 100 people to go for a steeply discounted rate, but all students are available to scan that QR code and do it. And if you guys have the code, I think it's just CFNI, right? That's the code. Yeah, it says it right there. So if you go to register for the conference, just register for, with the code CFNI and you can get it for $25. Amen? Amazing. All right, so I have the honor and privilege. Who, who knows about the quest in this house? We got a lot of you guys. You know, the Quest is just a, a, a dear ministry to CFNI. We've partnershiped, and I think dozens of you um, throughout CFNI have been able to go because of their generosity. So we also want to have the honor and privilege of today of having the founders of the Quest with us, Mr. and Mrs. Henderson. So if you guys would please welcome Mr. and Mrs. Henderson to the stage. Hey guys, my name is Richard, this is Paige Henderson, and I'm, I'm just curious, I'm just curious, just about, just a couple of weeks ago, 
we had a quest for men that my youngest son Maddox was on. And some of y'all were on that with him. Is anybody in here was on that with him? I just want to speak blessings over you guys. Man, he had such a good time with y'all. Man, y'all you, you guys got in him. I, I really appreciate it. He's an awesome guy, and he's my baby boy. So see if an eye is having a huge impact on the Henderson family. I, I say that, it's kind, of, it's kind of a ridiculous thing to say. For all these years, I've been in the Metroplex and have been a worship pastor for many years. And 22 years ago, God called us to begin this thing that we now call the quest. And you have the opportunity to go because the guys at, at uh, uh, Christian Brothers Automotive have offered to pay, pay your way to go on a quest. And so somebody has made a path for you to attend a quest. I'm not going to go into how we started Quest and where it came from and all that this morning because I have a, I have a quick word for you. So what I'm going to give you is what the Quest is about, right? And then you can, you can decide if, if you're called to that or not. John Bevere in his new book tells a story of a meeting with a, a really famous Christian leader who had gone to prison. And John sat down with him and said, so when did you stop loving Jesus? Legit question, right? The guy looked at him and said, I never stopped loving Jesus. John said, what happened? He said, I didn't fear the Lord. I loved Jesus, but I didn't fear the Lord. So I know on a Tuesday at 11 o'clock that I just kind of went, right? Chunked the grenade in the middle of the room. Here's the deal. Beginnings are awesome. And the energy that's in this room of new students and new time and new year and new classes and just new, it's awesome. Beginnings are a time when you don't have to do same o same o anymore. Right? So I don't know why you're here at Christ for the Nations. I don't know why you would think about taking five and a half days and going on a quest after the heart of God. But I can tell you the reason that we do it. We get rid of cell phones. We get rid of the stuff that distracts us. And we go deeply into the heart of God, and here's why. We're, we're divided Every second of every day. We've got stuff that is fighting for our attention. Every second of every day. You are the most fought after for attention group of people ever in the history of the world. Social media has made it its goal to get your attention. Every second of every day. And so you're going to have to do something to look at it and say no. Stop. I'm not interested in that. And I will tell you, the only way that you'll be able to do that is to get interested in something more. Is to be more interested in something else than in that. Because I've got a little I got a little word for you. What they're feeding you is more addictive than heroin. Literally, physically, mentally, emotionally, more addictive than heroin. So in this room right here today, we need a detox. We need a holy detox. And it starts with a group of people like all of us just looking at Dad and saying, Dad, I need help. I, I literally can't do this by myself. I can't, I can't turn this off by myself. I'm, I'm addicted to it. I want to know. I want to be liked. I want to know what people think about me. I want to know what people are doing. I want to. Dad, I need help. This is James 4. This is kind of heavy. James 4 says this You adulterers. Thanks, James. 
That's a, that's a happy way to start a cup of coffee. All right? He's not, talking about, he's not talking about sexual adultery. He's comparing what he's about to say to the lure of sex, right? So he's not talking about being sexually active. This is what he's talking about. Don't you realize that friendship with the world makes you an enemy to God? So y'all, it's worse than we think. It's not that friendship of the world, y'all have heard this preach, friendship separates you from God. That's not what the Bible says. Friendship with the world makes you an enemy to God. So what do you do? I say it again, if you want to be a friend of the world, you make yourself an enemy to God. Do you think the scripture have no meaning? They say that God is jealous and passionate that the spirit he has placed within us should be faithful to him. So here's the good news. There's something you can do about it. Psalm 86, 11 says this, teach me your way, O Lord, that I may walk in your truth. Give me an undivided heart that I may fear your name. Teach me your way, Y'all are here because something drew you to Psalm 86. You're here because something in you drew you to teach me your way, O oh Lord. Right? So you've taken steps. You've made sacrifices. You've done incredible things to get here to this place. And yet, I'm using this as a symbol, right? Still addicted. Anybody want to get unaddicted to that? You want to be addicted to something else? He created us to be filled with the Spirit, to be being filled with the Spirit, to constantly being filled up so that everywhere we go, the Spirit spills out of us, so that every thought we have is filtered through the Spirit, so that every thought we have is taken captive to the presence, to the spirit, to the power of the Lord. That's the only way to live this life like we're designed to live it. And unless we do, we'll be dissatisfied. I was dissatisfied for years and years and years and years and years. Being a worship leader that traveled the world and recorded and did all that stuff, I was dissatisfied for years and years and years. And the reason I was dissatisfied is because I had a divided heart. My heart was divided between the one, (laughs) the only one, and all the other stuff, studio time. Richard, you you were writing and doing Christian music. I was. And my heart was divided between the one and that. Y'all know that that can happen, right? I was studying the Bible and my heart was divided between that and the study of the Bible. How can that possibly happen? Well, I was studying the Bible so that I could get knowledge. And what does knowledge do? The Bible says that it puffs up. Puffs up is the opposite of being with him, right? (laughs) So what happens in five and a half days on an event? What happens in five and a half days on an event is... You get away and you spend that many hours just looking at him. Just looking at him. And breathing him in. And spending time with a divided heart and saying, no. No, I want that. I want want him. And readjusting. And it takes time, y'all. You are, what's the youngest person in here, 19 years old, 18, 19, 20 years old, huh? 18 years old. You've been 18 years getting addicted. Pinpoint working on you every second of every day to get you addicted to something that's not him. It's going to take some effort. It's going to take some purge to get this out of you. It's going to take some detox to get this out of you. You're in a good place. You're in a wonderful place here. Quest is one more available tool for you to get away with him 
and just come say, yes, Daddy, I need you. Daddy, I call out to you. My heart is divided. Some of you may have never had the thought that I'm talking about right now ever in your life. You might have come here thinking, my, my, my heart's not divided. I'm here at CFNI. That proves that I have an undivided heart. That proves that, that I have said no to these things and said yet. What it proves is, is you've taken the right steps. It proves you're on the right path. It doesn't prove that you're not addicted. So I'm going to ask you a question, just a, couple, just a couple of questions. How many times a day do you check this thing? Oh, Richard, did you have to shut up? Did you have to go there? And you know it's not just this thing, right? It's a, this is a symbol of all the other things. Can you turn this off? So yeah, the answer is yes, physically. Can you turn it off here? Can you turn it off here? Hey, y'all, it's time. Our world is in desperate shape. You live in a place that is incredibly different than it was when I was your age. And I'm praying for you that as you go through this, that you turn your gaze and your attention to him. To the point that you can smile at this and go, oh, you're just a tool. You're just a tool for me to use. I can turn you on and I can turn you off just like any other tool. I can pick up a drill and I can use that or I can use this, but you are no longer in control of me. You are no longer in control of my heart. You are no longer in control of my mind. The only love that I have, the only affection that I have is him. My prayer for you, for your generation and for you in particular here today, is that your heart does this, comes together as one heart. That's what we hope you do in an event. I'm so excited to be able to sit here and introduce Paige to you. She is awesome. I pray every day that people meet her first. Um, I should have introduced her first and let her speak first. You would have thought more of me after meeting her first. She is uh, amazing. I'm going to ask you to do something right now. If you just reach your hand out to her. This is what we're going to ask. I'm not going to pull any fast ones on you. We're going to ask that the Holy Spirit would fill her up because we have all heard enough words already out of my mouth today. So we're going to ask that the Holy Spirit would fill her up and that he would speak through her and give you exactly what you need. And let's do it all at once. Go. Pray that. Go. So, Daddy, I just ask you to fill Paige up from the bottom of her feet to the top of her head. Speak through her in Jesus' name. Amen. So Rich started with a pretty important thought that I want to continue on because that's exactly what the Lord has given me to share with you. But when I share, I, I, I got to use this because this is, this is the only perspective I have. It's really dangerous if you're hearing from me outside of Genesis to Revelation. So for your own safety and protection, I must stay right here. Here was the thought. The man said, I love Jesus. I just lost my fear of him. I want to share with you a series of verses that are really very common. You've heard them. You may have them memorized. Mamaw may have them embroidered on the wall somewhere. They are very familiar to us um, if you've been very deep in the New Testament at all. But before we get to those verses, I want to pin a context to it. Before we just have this disembodied set of verses, I want you to understand where they came from. The verses are out of Matthew, and the context of Matthew follows Malachi. So in the order of things, the Old Testament ends with Malachi, and the last thing, the last words out of God's mouth is, I'm coming to reset what I made in, Gen in Genesis. 
I'm going to come to restore relationship, and it's going to look like this. I'm going to restore the hearts of fathers to sons and sons to fathers. Or if that doesn't happen, I'm just going to wipe the whole thing out. I'm going to smite the land with a curse, and that's going to be it. See, in Genesis, God was very careful not to curse the current situation between himself and Adam. I don't know if you've taken the time to really look deeply at Genesis 3, but when God has that conversation with Adam and he asks all those questions, not because he didn't know, but because Adam needed to know where he was. God shows up in the garden and says, Adam, where are you? Do you really think the almighty sovereign God did not see Adam hiding in the bushes? Of course he did. He was giving Adam an opportunity to identify where Adam was in space. See, when the Lord comes asking you questions, it's not because he doesn't know. It's to invite you into conversation because he loves you. And many times we run from the conversation because we don't want to actually say the answer out loud. So we hide like Adam did. And God kept asking questions because he kept loving Adam. And if you read it very carefully, you'll see that he cursed the serpent and he cursed the ground, but he spoke to Adam and Eve. You know why? Because that which he curses stays cursed forever. And he left the door open to fix it. Directly to Eve, he says, there's a seed coming from you, Eve. The serpent that I've cursed will bruise him on the heel, but the seed coming from you will crush his head. And Paul repeats it. I'm going to leave the door open. That's what he says when he puts the angels in charge of the tree of life. Before they eat from the tree of life and live like this forever, like what? Separated from me, apart from me, loving me but not fearing me. Knowing about me, but not knowing me. Before that becomes their permanent condition, I'm going to need some time to put this thing back together. And a blink later on the scale of eternity, Jesus came. Now, there are a lot of words in between Genesis 3 and when Jesus came, and you're going to study them. But not for the eternal one. He had barely rolled his sleeves up when he reappears in the narrative. And the last thing he says before the introduction of Jesus in, in the cry of an infant in the dark is, I'm gonna restore it. And then there's 400 years of silence. 400 years. Have you ever thought about 400 years? That's 20 generations. If a generation is 20 years, it's 20 generations. I enjoy catching an episode every now and then on PBS called Finding Your Roots with Dr. Henry Louis Gates. I just find that fascinating because I'm a nerd at the end of the day. I can't help myself. I love history. I love looking at that. I love digging into stuff like that. 20 generations. Do you know where this nation was 400 years ago? Let's do some simple math. I believe the date was 1623. 400 years ago. So between Malachi and Matthew is 400 years from 1623 to 2023 of silence. Not a word. Not a prophet. Not a revelation. Not a law. Not an amendment to a law. Not a commentary on a law. Nothing for four hundred years. Jesus comes, pierces the night sky, an infant cry. He grows up in favor and wisdom and knowledge and all those good things. And then he calls his disciples and he's basically kind of keeping to himself, trying to lay low. Mama tries to expose the whole ministry thing at the wedding, which is a great story. And the verses we're about to read are the first public statements out of the mouth of God who said he was going to reset the whole thing in 400 years. So what we're about to look at, what I'm about to share with you very quickly, is a flow chart on how to recover. 
I'm reminded of another 400 years of silence. And the one that immediately popped to my mind is the 400 years that Israel spent enslaved to Egypt. That was also 400 years of silence where the people of God were promised and waited for a deliverer. And now we've got 400 years between Malachi and Matthew. The people are enslaved and they're waiting for a deliverer. And the deliverer is about to open his mouth and he's about to tell the people how to be delivered. I remember thinking for years, man, it would be great if the Lord would just give me a plan. Just give me a plan on how to get out of my Egypt. Because everybody has an Egypt. Everybody has a place where you're from. And your Egypt may literally be a place, or your Egypt may be the abuse, or the Egypt may be your abandonment, or the Egypt may be that you were raised in a godly Christian home, but you idolize it. And you can't get into the present because you're still holding on to the past. Paul said, forgetting what lies behind, and he didn't say that with a qualifier. We all love to forget what lies behind when what's behind us is our latest stupidity. But I don't know that I want to forget what lies behind when the, what's behind me is my latest success. But Paul said, leave it all. Because if you don't leave it all to live today, then it becomes your Egypt. So after 400 years of silence, the deliverer steps on the stage and everybody that's been waiting takes a breath. <gasps> What's he going to say? And what he's going to give you is a flow chart out. It also is the flow chart of what happens since Rich has invited you on the five and a half days of quest. But I'm going to give it all to you. For you to do with as he calls you to do. If you're taking notes, you might want to create a little chart here. Column one, what God says. Column two, what I'm going to do about it. We know this flow chart under a different name. And that is the Beatitudes. Y'all, this is a flow chart. It's also a cycle. It happens over and over and over again. Every time you have to shed something off of you to become something new. You know, every now and then a politician will say something actually profound and truthful. And I heard years ago, <laughs> years ago, uh, Jeb Bush was being interviewed not, not long after GW had left office. And they were asking him about his own political aspirations. He said, I don't know that I have any. And they were challenging him on that to just say, but you always, but you always, but this is what you wanted. And this has been your goal your whole life. And this is what you were cut out to be. And why aren't you running it? Why won't you do the thing? And on and on and on and on. And he finally just looked at the interviewer and he said this, everybody has the right to shed their skin. Pause on that a minute. Why does a critter shed his skin so that he can grow? So lessons on how to grow and how to get out of Egypt right here, Matthew 5. And now I'm just going to run through them real quick. Because now that you know it's a flow chart, you know that what comes first spills into what comes next, spills into the next, spills into the next, spills into the next. These are not isolated great ideas. They're dependent on one another. And you also need to know that because the Beatitudes are set up, blessed do this, and then you get that. And then blessed are you here because you do that. And we say blessed because it's church talk, and that's what we do because it sounds churchy. But when you're, ble you're blessed when you do this and this is what you get, they're not isolated blessings, y'all. They're compounded so in other words, you can't skip number two because you don't like it and jump from blessing one to blessing three. It stops at two when you won't walk in it because they're compounded. I don't know if you've ever seen those videos of them pouring champagne at some kind of party and they've got that huge three-dimensional pyramid of glasses. 
And they start at the top and the champagne fills and then it overflows and it overflows and it overflows and it overflows. And by pouring only at the top, you fill all the glasses. It's really, really cool. That's the blessing of God. If you pull glasses out of the middle because you just didn't want to deal with that round of glasses, you break up the whole thing because it has to flow from the top. And the flow of the blessing of the restoration of you starts with this in verse 3. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. It begins with you recognizing you can't do it on your own. Period. I've lost my fear of the Lord, maybe you would say this morning, because that pierced you. I felt it in the room. I felt something shift in the room because I think there's a quite a few of you in here who would say, I love Jesus. I didn't do what I did because I don't love Jesus. I'm not in the trouble that I'm in right now because I don't love Jesus. I'm not depressed because I don't love Jesus. I've lost the fear. I've lost the edge. That's a direct quote from Top Gun. I just thought I'd throw it out there because sometimes, you know, if you know it, yeah. I've lost the fear. So where does it, where do you begin the restoration? By recognizing it's not in you. You can't be cute enough, smart enough, sassy enough to get it done. You don't have it in you. It's not that you come crawling in on your belly in a puddle full of tears. Is that you simply wake up, look at yourself in the mirror and take an honest assessment and you answer the question that he's asking you. Where are you? I am right here, Lord, and I can't do it myself. You're going to be faced with a lot of things this semester. You probably have some things hanging out there right now that, that are yet unfinished because here's the truth. You can't do it on your own. He and he alone holds the restoration for you. He and he alone holds the answer for you. He's got your next steps. He's got the next plan. You don't know how to fix this. You don't know how to get out of it. He does. You don't know how you're going to pull it off. He does. You don't know what the next answer is. He does. And when you're poor in spirit, you'll recognize that you have all the resources of heaven in your hand. And the water begins to flow on the top, and it's running down. And number two in the flow chart, after you recognize that, then you begin to mourn. What is it you mourn? You mourn your sin. You mourn how they hurt you. Listen to the list because it's huge. You mourn your sin. You mourn their sin. You mourn how you've hurt people and how they've hurt you. You mourn that the world is a broken place. And you mourn it, and you can't skip the morning. You can't skip the morning. You can't just sleep in till the afternoon. It comes. Here's what the writer of Ecclesiastes said. He gives us a, a list that the birds put in a, a, a very cool song in the 60s at some point. I don't know. I'm way too young to remember all that. But there's a, there's a collection of pairs, and the pairs go together. And mourning goes with dancing. And most of us want to go to the dance, but we want to skip the mourn. You can't go to the dance until you mourn. Yep, she did that thing to you. Mourn it. He hurt you. Mourn it. You lied to them. Mourn it. The situation didn't work out. Mourn it. Here's the truth about mourning that makes mourning different than grieving. Grieving is perpetual. It's like getting stuck in a whirlpool in a river. You just keep going around and around and around and around. Mourning has a beginning, a middle, and an end. It is healthy. And for mourning, you get comfort. For grief, you just get more grief. That you mourn what has happened doesn't mean you're going to spend your, the rest of your life on a bench just crying. You're going to be the, the crying girl. There she is. She's crying. She's still crying. She's just always crying. No, there's a moment that it ends, but it can't end until it begins. And if you fear beginning, you'll never get to the end and you'll never dance. It's time. It's time. Because here's the truth about 
blocked mourning. It's oppressive and everybody around you knows it. If you think you're fooling anybody by keeping it way deep in the bottom of your backpack, the only person you're fooling is you because everybody around you knows. Go ahead and mourn it so that it can be done so that you can get on with the next thing. The next thing is blessed are the gentle, blessed are the meek. That word meek is one of my favorite words in scripture. It is not, it does not mean that you sit with your hands folded waiting for somebody to tell you what to do. The gentleness that's here, the meekness that's here is tame, T-A-M-E, tame. In order to be tame, that word requires wild. I told you I was a geek. I'm a true word nerd. In order to be tame, you can't be tame if you weren't wild. Wild is required for the definition of tame, right? If something just comes to you from the very beginning, and it was never wild, you can't say it was tame. Yeah? Okay? So what Jesus is telling us here, part of this process is to submit your wild to the Holy Spirit because you have wants and desires and the way that you want to go, but you let him take the rein. And that's where this word picture is coming from. Meek is like a racehorse. I have a friend who raises racehorses. They actually kind of tripped into it accidentally. Somebody gave them a thoroughbred that they could not tame. And from there, they, that's, that has become now their livelihood. They, they train thoroughbreds. Here's what I know about a thoroughbred. Their legs are too skinny and their bodies are too strong to do anything but run. They don't pull plows, they don't pull carriages, they don't do any of that. They just run. You are a thoroughbred. You're not a carriage puller, you're a runner. You were born to it. But here's what I know about these thoroughbreds. If they will not submit to their training, they are still loved, they're just kept in a pasture. They're fed, they're visited but they never get to do what they were called to do. Y'all, you are here to activate what God's put in your heart to do, but you won't get to run if you won't let yourself be tamed. Blessed are the tame. Now, what's the goal of the tame? The goal of the tame is that after you realize you can't do it yourself, Blessed are the poor in spirit. And then you mourn over what's happened. Blessed are those who mourn, they'll be comforted. Then you get a target to live beyond. I am not going to be in the biblical sense. Okay, so I'm speaking biblically and metaphorically here. I'm not going to be identified with Egypt anymore. Y'all realize that's not a nationality in what we're talking about, right? I am not going to be associated with the oppression anymore. I'm not going to be associated with what they did anymore. I'm going to break out of here as surely as thoroughbreds break out when the bell sounds because I have prepared for this moment. It's not accidental. This is intentional. Thoroughbreds don't just wake up one day and rub against a saddle and it pops on them. And then they just go to town till they find somebody that wants to get on the saddle and then they run. No, it's intentional. And if you've ever watched the breaking of a horse, I bet you can find a lot of documentaries. It's also a violent exercise because it is the laying down of what you want for what he wants. Paul said it like this. This is what he said of his own horse training. I have been crucified with Christ. It's not me running anymore. I go where the rider leads me. The life I now live, I live for him. And when you run like that, you inherit the earth. Next little box, next overflow. And when you recognize you're poor in spirit and you mourn the thing and you understand what the target is and you release yourself into his authority, then you will begin to hunger and thirst for righteousness. Now I want more. I like this and I want more. 
This satisfies me all the way to the bottom of my toes. This is what I was made for. Tell me more. Give me more. Challenge me more. Run me harder. I want more. I want more. I want more. And you know what happens when you want more? You're filled. And when you recognize, beginning at the beginning, you're poor in spirit, you can't do it yourself, and then you mourn the stuff that's happened and everything that's happening around you, and that holy dissatisfaction drives you to lay down your own will, to allow yourself to be tamed by the Holy Spirit, and you begin to hunger and thirst for more, and you're feeding on that kind of nutrition, then, next in the flow chart, you can be merciful. Mercy doesn't just bubble up in you. But it comes from those who know. Who know. It's not in you either. And when we rub against those who, like us, love Jesus, but they've lost the edge of the fear. Well, there's nothing but mercy there. You get it. Because you've tasted it. You've had those long conversations in your own mirror. You've answered God's hard questions in your own heart. You've recognized your own lack in your own spirit. You've mourned the stuff that's happened to you. You know how difficult it is to accept what he's given you to do. You know what it's like to be hungry and be thirsty and be filled. And there's nothing left in your heart but mercy. And then when mercy comes, next overflow, it begins to purify your heart. This is not being pure in heart. You were born like that. Mm -mm. This is where the purification of your heart begins to happen. You're not pure in heart just because you say so. You're pure in heart because you worked at it. Because his spirit guided you into fill in the blank. You believed him. You exercised what you said you believed. That's faith. And your heart became purified. And in the purification, you begin to see God. Oh, I see. I see what you're doing, Lord. I see you in this place. I see you in this situation. I hear you right here in Walmart. I see you in my notes. I understand what you're doing. It's deeper than just opening your eyes and physically seeing God. Your heart has been purified. And where did the purification begin? It began all the way back at the beginning of the flow chart. Being poor in spirit, I can't do it myself. Mourning the stuff that's happened, the stuff you've done and the stuff that's been done to you and the fact that we live in a place where stuff happens. And then you set your target on the fact that there's something more important and bigger and greater and you want that more, you hunger and thirst for it. And in doing that, you can be merciful to yourself and to those around you. And in the course of receiving that mercy, your heart is purified. Now you're in a position to learn stuff. Now you're in a a, a position to actually be transformed. And in that transformation, you begin to see the Lord everywhere. You hear him on the radio in country music. You see him at Walmart where the metal pans are. You find him at QT in the person next door. Everything is him. And the overflow just continues. And the blessing keeps mounting up. Because after that, then you can become a peacemaker. Not a peacekeeper. A peacemaker. One who makes peace. And it's entirely different than someone who keeps peace. Some of you in this room know what war is personally. Someone who comes to keep peace just keeps people from shooting each other. Someone who makes peace removes the violence. Making peace requires coming to the table. 
Making peace requires having conversations. Making peace is without compromise or negotiation. Making peace in the name of the Prince of Peace. Because here's, here's who you are. See, as this blessing has been overflowing, it's been restoring to you your identity. So let's grab hold of what it means to be a peacemaker. Back in Isaiah, when Isaiah was talking about the coming deliverer, there was a whole list of adjectives that describe him, and we read it every Christmas, and it's a lovely reading. His name will be called, say it with me if you know it, Wonderful, Counselor, Almighty God, Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. You, Paul says, are his heir. That means you get his stuff because he's died, right? And now he sits at the right hand of the father. He no longer has need of his stuff, so he bequeathed it to you. What did he leave you? He left you his kingdom of peace. That's you. You know, Jesus, if you, uh, Jesus told his disciples this kind of quirky verse, if you haven't examined peace. When he was talking to his disciples, he said, you can leave your peace in their home. As you go, you can leave your peace. Well, what's that? Well, welcome to my world. Study that for the next five, six, seven years and see what you come up with. Here's what I know. Peace is the balance between God's truth and the way I live. And sometimes the peacemaking has to happen in me. He tells me to forgive and I want to be bitter and there's a war. And this thoroughbred goes off the rails and begins to hurt people because I want it my way. And I have to go all the way back to verse 3 and start over. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Because this is not only a flow chart, it's a cycle. So what happens when you work through being a peacemaker to continue with the idea that it's your identity? Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called the children of God. So in my East Texas slang, here's how I would write that verse. You're blessed when you make peace, y'all. Because you look like your daddy when you do. See, beginning with being poor in spirit, you recognize it's not in me to do this. I don't have it in me. And then I begin to mourn the things that happen in me, around me, the things that I've done, the things that have been done to me. And then I see a greater target and that fuels my desire to run the race that's been set before me. I'm not satisfied as a bystander anymore. I don't want to be an observer. Put the saddle on me, Holy Spirit, and let's go. And when I run, the act of running burns calories, and I begin to hunger and thirst. But I don't just hunger and thirst for what I want, not empty nutrition. This is not a food desert. I begin to hunger and thirst for his righteousness, the right thing that he tells me to do. And when I hunger and thirst for it, I am filled and as I'm filled, I recognize I don't have time to hold your offenses against you anymore. I don't have time for a critical spirit or a judgmental spirit. That is bad hay to this racehorse. And I'm not going to eat it. I'm going to be merciful. And as I am merciful, I begin to see, ah, oh, there's a whole life out there. It's so much bigger than me. And my heart begins to be purified Paul calls that the, the process of sanctification. I begin to be transformed, and as I do, I see him everywhere. And as I see him, I can make peace. And when I make peace, the next verse, bring on your persecution. Because you know what happens when you hurt me? I'm going to go back to verse 3. Because this is a process of getting out from under oppression. 
You can criticize me. I'll go back to verse 3. You can disagree with what I'm doing. I'll go back to verse 3. You can be outright just mean, and I'll go back to verse 3, because I always have access to this process. Jesus told me I could have it. And you know what happens after that? Then Jesus calls me the salt of the earth and the light of the world. None of these things are just random sticky notes that Jesus shoved in his pocket before he left heaven with God saying, oh, don't forget to tell him this. And, and when you get to tell him this, and, and then I'm telling him this. This isn't a random collection. This is a strategic outline. How do you get out of Egypt? How do you move your identity from oppression to freedom? And it's always available. It's always been available. It's right there. I invite you to look at it on your own. See if you don't see that it's a process. See if it doesn't become a flow chart for you. See if you don't feel the compounded blessing. Because that's what he's given us to do. Lord, I thank you for your word. I thank you that your word is truth and truth is seed. Create good soil here for the seed of truth that is you. Plant it deep. For those in this room who just need to get over themselves, Lord, I pray that you would give them poverty in their spiritedness to think that they can do it themselves, that they would ask you, that they would come to the table with you. For those that need to mourn because it's just been too long, Lord, draw them to a place of compassion where your Holy Spirit can comfort and release them from that oppression. Lord, for those that are ready to run, they're chomping at the bit. They're going to explode if they don't run. Bring them out. Bring them out into the corral and realign the freedom of their will to you. For those that are ready to walk as you made us to be, those who carry about in us the citizenship of peace, Lord, restore. Restore our hunger and our thirst. Restore our mercy and our grace. Restore what we see. And at the end of the day, do what you do in your generosity. Bless and bless and bless and bless. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you all for letting us be here with you all today. If you want to quest, if, you, if you're drawn to this, see, see one of your deans and they'll get you hooked up, right? If there's quest alumni in here, would you do something for us? Would y'all take one minute and come up here and let me get a picture with y'all? All right, could y'all do that? Quest alumni, if y'all would come up. And really quickly, guys, um, if you are interested in going to Quest sometime next semester, because thank the Lord, all of the Quests are full for the rest of the semester. Um, but if you are interested in going starting in January, please send an email to the women's department or to the men's department, and we will give you this proper steps. Thank you. So if you're a quester, come up to the front. Otherwise, you are officially dismissed. <laughs>